Ah. Ah. That's good. Oh. This is great. Yeah, I'm in a very different place from two years ago. Yeah. I'm ready to talk, and also, just so much has happened. Sex positive culture. It's my body to give. Are threesome gifts a thing? Taking a bra off. I like your bed. Horizontal. 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 This is Horizontal with Lila. You want to take it one more time? Yes. Okay. That was a really good one, babe. <laughs> And positive reinforcement. Yeah. So good. So good. So good. That's super great. I'm Lila, and I'm horizontal in the Bronx, New York. I'm Orion. And I'm Tiana. And, and we're, we're horizontal, horizontal with, with Lila. Lila. <laughs> I can't like stop grinning uncontrollably every time. <laughs> I'm like, this is my favorite part. I know. I know. I'm all cool. Cool to keep going. <laughs> In horizontal, I take some of my very favorite things. Sleepovers, spooning, storytelling, sex, and stargazing. And metaphorically roll them all up into podcast form. Every episode is recorded while reclining. It's slow radio. It's intimacies of all kinds. It's consensual eavesdropping. It's us lying down right next to one another, wearing robes, sharing secrets in your ears. Welcome back to part two of four episodes with my dear friends, primary poly partners, kinky lovers, entrepreneurs, and leaders in the poly kink people of color community, Tiana and Orion. In episode 78, surprise, surprise, he liked black chicks. We dove into Tiana's sexual development. We talk about natural musk, her parents' divorce, Commuting between the two households. What Tiana and Orion's parents have in common. Face sitting on teddy bears. Her first inklings of exhibitionism. Being a good girl, then fucking till you die. How Tiana met her husband in middle school by dropping books on him. The story of their marriage. A very good tip for anal play. The taint. Camming on chatterbait. Looking for threesomes on field. Tiana's first polycule and first triad. And how her ex demolished their relationship by wiping out their accounts on payroll day. And that was just the first quarter of our conversation. I suggest you listen to it first. In this episode, we discuss Orion's family legacy. The violence of his father his mother's pattern of dating abusive men, coding love based on what we experienced as children, and how even abuse can be coded as love if it was all you could get from your caregivers. Witnessing more than one way to father. Poverty and private school. Orion's interplay with the archetype of the strong black woman. Us against the world mentality. Compartmentalization. Bullying. Orion, the soldier, and the beast. Going to the Renaissance Fair as a black couple. Microaggressions at a white boat party. How Orion is the first black male primary partner that Tiana has had. And Orion's biggest difficulty being in relationship with Tiana. I don't think you'll guess what it is. And this is just part two. You definitely want to hear part three and four of this conversation. Tiana and Orion allow us to witness the inner workings of their relationship, talking through the biggest strain that they've experienced so far. Live. Involving broken agreements, a communication breakdown, and sex with a secondary partner. It is fresh. It's living. New information is revealed in the conversation. There is hurt and introspection, questioning, and loving challenge. And we get to hear in real time how they work through the deep feels. They are beyond generous to allow us this true window into their poly life. It is an edge. 
I am deeply honored that they would navigate that edge and allow us to listen in and benefit. This has been my aim for the podcast all along, to allow you to eavesdrop on a private conversation so that we can learn some of the forms that intimate dialogue can take. I feel certain there's something there for you, Polly or not. In order to listen to part three and four, become a patron of the Horizontal Arts. Go to patreon.com slash horizontal with Lila. It's spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash horizontal with Lila. At the base tier of $10 a month, you get access to the full horizontal, including all the part twos going back to the very beginning, or in this case, threes and fours, plus access to the secret patrons Facebook group with behind the scenes access and a monthly video of intimacy tips and a love poem. In keeping with my commitment to myself to rewire my nervous system for joy by celebrating triumphs of any size, I have something to share. On May 21st, 2019, I will celebrate two years of horizontal, a horizontal anniversary. I have never loved a project for so long before. I have never felt so powerfully committed to a mission before. And I have never before had the sole satisfaction of knowing that my work resonates. I'm going to mark this occasion in two ways. First, with another Confetti Project Open Studios photo shoot. Expect very sparkly things. And then, on May 21st, the very May 21st, with a horizontal anniversary party at which the invitees are all previous Horizontal guests and current patrons. At this party, I plan to attempt the recording of an episode unprecedented in the Horizontal verse, and we'll see how that goes. I'd be honored if you'd celebrate this milestone with me in any of these ways. Becoming a patron. Sending me a personal message about how a particular Horizontal concept or episode has made a difference for you. Or by sharing this art I've made you with the people you love most in the world. Thank you for listening. Come lie down with us again in the Bronx, New York. Could he just not stand you being so free? Possibly. But he had the same freedoms. It wasn't like I was denying him anything. anything. Yeah, I was encouraging. I only wanted the best for him. And and he enjoyed being poly. That, that's the other thing I have to emphasize. Some people are like, oh, well, you opened up your marriage. Of course, that's why it fell apart. And I was like, well, no, it actually helped our marriage for like this bit. Like we had better communication between each other. We had a newfound love you know, for each other. We liked watching each other fall in love. That was actually really, really sweet and amazing to, like, watch him falling in love with his girlfriend and then, like, him watching me fall in love with my boyfriend and mm. then us gushing about our lovers to each other. <laughs> like, that was actually super hot. And oh. one of the things that, like, would be foreplay for us would be, like, talk about our dates after we came home and then have crazy sex. Ooh. It was, like, really amazing. And I was like, oh, my God, yes, hashtag poly life all the way. <laughs> so it, it – but that's how I feel like I can continue to do it now is because I know that it has its good moments. Like, I've seen it. I was there. I've lived it. I've breathed it. And I know how to do it better now or at least be in a position where – I don't make the same mistakes where it can blow up in my face and I hurt myself and I hurt the people around me. Hmm. You're very brave. Hmm. Hearing it in this way gets me to know you more too. Orion, you mentioned all these parallels with Tiana's origin story and... Yes. Your father, I've only heard you speak about him. We've known each other for... 13 years now and yes. I've only heard you speak about your father 
Definitely less than a handful of times, I think maybe only twice when we used to do our massage trades once a week. Mm. When did you realize that your father was a violent man? Oh, pretty early on. My, my mom doesn't hold back, you know, the why of why they were not together. And I, she would tell me a story that I don't remember where I guess he was attacking her and I somehow put myself in between them and maybe tried to hit him or something like that. And obviously, we had, I don't know, whatever age that was, two or three or whatever it was. Oh, my God. You know, it's not much I could do, but he did stop. So there was that. Or actually, no, I'm sorry. That was another situation. She had a few abusive boyfriends. Oh, my God. She was in a dangerous situation. I guess I screamed in a way that I uh, gave him pause. And, uh, you know, we're all still here. So... You're telling me that your mother had a pattern of dating abusive men. Yeah, for sure. Do you understand anything about that? She's had a kind of an abusive life or a life of abuse. Family members in just tough living situation. Both of my parents are from Cologne, Panama, which is a very just poor city. I think doing better now, but in the 50s and 60s, certainly not very dangerous place. It's just a lot of dog eat dog. Everybody's fighting for survival, shall we say. It just definitely led to a situation where people just didn't treat each other very well. Not that that's an excuse, but just people get caught up in this very survivalist, lack of abundance mentality. It leads to more of like a might to make to right sort of headspace. And she just got caught up in a world where people just didn't treat each other well. So... It was all she knew. And to speak about repeating patterns, there was definitely certain ways that even the way that she raised me, she's, you know, she's a good, good woman, but certain aspects of her way or the highway definitely played out in my own marriage and certainly led me to choosing someone that didn't always really hear me, even when I tried to communicate things that were uh, challenging to hear uh, to her, yeah, it just led to ultimately a, a breaking point. But to, to back things up a bit, a part of why I allowed that was definitely because of nurture, but also because I was definitely not going to be the abusive guy. But I also didn't, didn't have any of her tools, so I just kind of went into inaction. I was reminded as you were talking about abuse being what your mother knew of this school of life video. You know, there's the, the animated things and the British voice yes. talking about relationships. Yes, and, yes, yes. And On inter YouTube. Human interactions. Yeah, it's and, really good. And there's one, I'll find it, but it's about how we learned to code love based on what we experienced as children. Mm. And even abuse can become coded as love if that's all you can get from your caregivers, mm -hmm. which can lead to seeking out abusive relationships without even realizing it mm -hmm. because it feels like the love that you are familiar with, used the to. kind of wounding that you are used to. Mm -hmm. Do you think that happened with your mom? Yes, for sure. Based on her family history to her relationship history, absolutely. So early on, she told you, like, your dad's, your dad's a violent man. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm not with him. And did you see him at all? I mean, afterward, we did have weekends uh, here and there, but he was mostly not around. I would spend time with the mother of my half-sisters, and he would just be out doing whatever he was doing, either being with other woman or, I don't know, doing whatever he was doing. I, I didn't spend a ton of time with him. He was also unreliable and largely absentee. Yes. Mm. Did you feel resentful? No, because I didn't know anything else. That's just what a dad is? It's not the way I, I want a parent, but... No, but I mean, at that time, do you think? did you think, well, that's what a dad is like? Okay. 
I think, you know, my, my ex has challenged me on this too, and she was right to do so. So I think the conclusion, and feel free to challenge me more, I'm happy to do the work, is that I was upset about his behavior at the time. I also understood that I had no control over him and that I could make different choices. And How did you know that? My uncle is a very present father. I, you know, spent summers with him and he was great for myself and my cousins, his, his three children, and very dutiful to his wife, my aunt, and... So you had a model. Yes. You had dads can be like that mm -hmm. or dads can be like that. Sure. Mm. I'd prefer to be like that dad. Yes. And then further along, I, I got a scholarship and I was in private school from sixth grade on, which I believe is another thing that Tiana and I share. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. and was it also a very not diverse private school? Oh, yeah, for sure. Old money. So you're, <laughs> so you're both among the very few black people in your private high schools. Yes, correct. At sixth grade. Yes. yes. Exact same time. Yes. Oh, in sixth grade. Sixth mm -hmm. grade. We started at sixth grade. We both did. Both of you. Yes. Yeah. Wow. I didn't yes. know that about you both. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it gets weirder. We have like we both mm -hmm. have two, we both have two metal names. Like it's, it's, it's you know just there's a lot of there's a lot of so it's weird. And then <laughs> you were able to because you were integrated socially. Yes. And did you kind of did you start code switching then? Did you start respectability politics mm. then? No, I did not. It was very I don't know how it was for Tiana, but uh, there was a thing where I just felt like I was getting shit on no matter what, because I would go home and get teased by, you know, the kids in the hood by going to the white school. And mm -hmm. then I would go to school and, get you know, teased by the rich kids there because, you know, I couldn't afford the same blazer and whatever. And maybe the way I spoke because I had a stronger accent at the time. Both of my parents are from Panama, so I had a Caribbean Latin accent. I still, I'm sure it's coming up even now, but it's definitely a lot less distinct than it was then. Wow. To the point where I know a lot of people say, you don't sound like you're from New York. You sound like you have no accent at all. So clearly I've done some work on it based on that situation. But and if you put me around the right folk from the hood, I can also switch back in a moment's notice. It's not even an issue. But real quick, when I was with the kids that were nice to me in the private schools and I was spending weekends or some time in their homes and seeing their family units, I could see that it seemed at least that it was a lot more functional where the father was present, even though he may go out and make, you know, incredible amounts of money. And, but there's a level of presence that I once again saw some good modeling there. I just wanted to add that in. Yeah. And then we can go back into the school experience. Well, I think that's, that's really powerful because it wasn't just one or the other is what you're telling me. You had multiple models of what looked like positive fatherhood. Yes. You know, who knows? We don't know what's going on in the inside of those relationships. No. But you could see yeah. more examples. They're more present than my own dad, that's for sure. <laughs> yes. And I wasn't hearing any stories about anybody hitting their moms or, you know. And certainly my uncle was not doing that to my aunt, so, you know. You and I have talked already a bit about your mother's archetype of the strong black woman. Sure. And you said there's some of that that made her harder on you. Yes. She wanted to be a father and mother to me. And she had ideas of what a father was. Strict. Very strict. Corporal punishment for sure. What kind? Oh, um, anything from hands to uh, a shoe to a belt to I I I have, I have scars. Holy fuck! Yeah, so on your butt. Mm, I think I have something on my elbow, and yeah, maybe some small nicks elsewhere. You know, it wasn't always just on my butt. Near joints. That's so scary. <laughs> so. Um, mm. And then I guess the worst one was that she thought there was something that I did, excuse me, something that I did, but I didn't do. And then I got really, I got my ass whooped for it. And I spoke to her about it years later and she did apologize, 
but that was definitely one of the last few times that I even allowed it. There's a moment, I guess, after that punishment that I totally didn't deserve. I don't think anybody deserves any level of corporate punishment unless they consent to it. But, uh, uh, <laughs> but, unless they consent to it. <laughs> but, um... So you have a daughter, but you operate under a no physical punishment model? At this point, yes. I, there are definitely times that both my ex and I have used corporal punishment, but it, it's just nothing near what I experienced. And certainly, I, it's been years, actually. It's more like the super dangerous stuff, like, you know... She might use the bathroom and then start playing around in the toilet. And I'm like, like you're going to you kill yourself, <laughs> you know? This is really bad. You should know this is really bad. And I don't know how else to make it clear. A- in hindsight, yeah, I probably would have made a different decision. But what I will say is that uh, definitely nowhere near the deep end. She certainly has no scars. It was very short-lived seconds as opposed to like a whole session. Yeah. And as... Um, my ex and I both improved on our communication skills and, you know, certainly was less need for that. It was easier to just communicate why something is wrong in a way that a daughter could understand. I can't even remember the last time there's, you know, I've used, I can't even remember. It's well, well before I moved out, which is almost three years now. It's been a very long time. Mm, so the thread of... A strong black woman being harder on her man or her son than anybody else would be. So that I could be strong for the world outside. For the world outside. Yes. Which is heartbreaking. Sure. The world outside was, was, is not very nice. So in that sense, she was correct. I don't know if the corporal punishment, I don't think that was necessary. I don't promote it or continue it. You know, it's not an excuse, but she worked with the tools that she had. It's really a sad thing that those were the best tools that she thought she had. Yeah. It's been interesting, you know, because with she and I, it's kind of like an us against the world sort of thing for the longest time. Your mom and you? Yes. And as I've gotten older, I have not ascribed to that victim mentality and it's led to a lot of strife between us because that was the relationship that's her safe place but it was also the circumstances wasn't it there were tough circumstances 100 percent. there was hunger uh, i was homeless for a while for sure we had some community that that helped us out and so there were places that i could stay at and be fed but there's definitely situations where i was in dangerous situations where uh, you know I was in somebody's house and there's a there's like a domestic dispute and somebody pulled out a gun and you know like there's all sorts of crazy stuff. There's definitely lots of challenges. It's funny to be like in a situation where somebody pulls out a gun on you and then the next day you're in, you're in private school like the richest people in the world. <laughs> it's very surreal. <laughs> How did you deal with that culture shock or dissonance? I just assented to one reality when I was in it and then the other reality when I was in that. I won't say as far as a split personality, but maybe not so far. Is that compartmentalization? Yeah. Yes, that is that is the word. And I definitely am a big compartmentalizer to this very day. And, I, you know, I think it's a better or for worse thing. I think it can probably drive some folk nuts. Like, how can you just literally shift the way you are, depending on a situation? It gives, I think sometimes it puts people in a situation where they don't know who they're dealing with, because I can be extremely consistent. And then depending on circumstances, I can just shift Mm. as a survival mechanism. But maybe it's not that serious nowadays, but it really was at one point. Well, compartmentalization, like any shadow, it has a gift. And like any gift, it has a shadow. Yes. Right? And it depends on, on how you wield it. Yes. And how wielding it affects you. Yes. Yes. I mean, I think of myself as having like three sides, you know, the side that um, most people experience was very kind and gentle and a good listener and patient. 
and loving. And then there's the side that whatever the task is at hand, whatever the mission is, it just gets taken care of at all costs. And that would be the me that was when my ex was out of work and we had this newborn and I just had to survive because she was the breadwinner and all of a sudden I had to like make it all happen. I would get up at 3.30 in the morning and like work till like eight mm. or nine at night. And then like she was in a big depression. So I had to like do the laundry and the cooking and the groceries and basically anything that wasn't nursing, nursing our daughter. And, you know, just get up the next day and do it again. And then for some reason, as a survival mechanism, I trained for a marathon just to kind of like, that was a way to blow up steam. But I was very cold. And I literally was like, all that mattered was the family and just trying to be as successful as possible. And I pushed away friends and even family because if they weren't like about helping me move forward or somehow helping me finance my situation than what we used to they have. So the first side is Mr. Gentle and the second side is Mr. Brutal and it's what's just, the third side? I don't know, I don't know if that's brutal. Dude. No? The, the, Let's say uh, Mr. <laughs> Mission? It's going to be a mission so I call, I call it Soldier. Okay, the Soldier. What yeah. do you call the other one? Orion. You call him Orion. Yes. So there's Orion and there's the Soldier. Yeah. And then? The Beast. The Beast. Yes. Tell me about the Beast. It's not much to say like luckily lately it's been a very long time oh my god i think i i think you told me the story about the last time can you tell me the story about the last time the beast came out sure it was the bully yeah uh yeah there are two bullies there was the physical bully and there was the mental bully the mental bully was the was the later story so ninth grade and this kid just would physically pick on me constantly he was new to the school as well I was new to high school, ninth grade. He was new to school, but came in in 10th grade. And he decided that I was going to be the stepping stone to, I guess, his coolness. It was an all-boys school. Yeah, he just kept like picking on me, pushing me to lockers, flicking my ear, et cetera, et cetera. He kept doing that sort of thing. And I had a conversation with him. And I said, if this keeps happening, there's going to be a response. How did he touch you? Oh, just pushing me into lockers or flicking my ears or anything of the sort little jabs here and there. So I had the conversation with him and he said, oh, I'm just missing a few, man, no big deal. And I just repeated myself, if this keeps happening, there's going to be a response. So he thought it was funny. And we let it go at that point. And then I was at lunch one day and I was eating food. And anybody that knows me knows that food is very important to me. <laughs> Back then, <laughs> before that, to this day, in the future. <laughs> and he smacks the shit out of me in the back of my head. With his hand. Yes. While I'm eating food. I was sitting alone. I clearly wanted a moment to myself. So I look up and there he is smiling. And he's like, oh, you know, do you have a problem with that? And he keeps kicking my foot. So I get up and I take a deep breath. He's looking at me like, what's this guy going to do? And I punch him in the face and he gets dazed, which is too bad. So I do it again and I keep whack, whacking on him. And then I, at some point, somehow my fingers were in his eye sockets. At this point, people realized that there's a fight happening and then they pulled us apart. Somehow this, there's a railing that teacher was on a slightly higher level than, than us. And he reaches down and he pulls on my collar and I was getting ready to punch him again. And my punch goes wild and hits this like metal barrier thing. My hand, you know, gets broken on that. So. Somehow to this day, I can still give awesome massages, but my right hand's totally broken. And I got in trouble for that. So did he. We both got suspended, and it was basically, like, I guess, a warning. So a year later, another kid, just a lot of psychological. He just kept telling me that I was stupid and worthless, and he kept saying things like that. And it just went on just, just incessantly every freaking day. I was like, dude, can you just chill? And he's, he's like, I'm just messing with you, man. I'm like, I don't, I don't like it. I don't need it. I, I don't like it. It's going to be problems. Just please stop. So same situation. He thought it was just a big joke. And then in the midst of all this, I was dealing with my life outside of school and situations where I almost got jumped in this, in this week before I really lost it. And then I did some work for a lady in a building and then the, the took hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. And she paid me basically next to nothing for it. And I just had to eat it. 
And I can't remember all of the stresses, but I just remember a Sunday before going to school, the next day I talked to my mom and I said, you know, tomorrow I'm going to flip. She's like, oh, what do you mean? And I was telling her what was going on in my life at the time and particularly how this kid was torturing me. And she just gave me a pep talk and I felt better. I felt like I could make it through. She asked if I had gotten support from teachers and other staff in school. And I told her not really. That's kind of one of the anti-perks of being a scholarship kid, you know? It's like, you make it or you don't. It's not really, you're not going to get the same level of support than the kids who are actually paying (laughs) to go to the school are. I think that's not fair to say about all private schools. I think they've gotten better. It's a 12-year difference between us. I think they've gotten a lot better. Mm. A lot better. Because to your point, you're right, I have heard much better reports from generations or whatever you're going to say after me. But certainly at the time, it was not like that. But to your point, the school I was at before was definitely more supportive. So I have to redact that. You're right. I'm sorry. This yeah. one. This one was not. you. Was not. Was not. not. Yes. You were pretty much on your own there. Yeah. And I had a big feeling of that inside and outside of the school. Ultimately, we got to the end of the day. It was the last class. I was in the chemistry class. And I was sitting in the back of the room, and the, the kid that always teased me was sitting right in front of me. So the teacher, a new teacher, was talking about the, the periodic table of elements. And I didn't quite hear what she said. And I asked her to repeat herself, and she did. She was cool with it. And he looked back and basically said, you know, if you were just like a little sharper or whatever he said, something about like if you yeah. paying better attention, it just always has to have a, a comment. And I just remember thinking, that's it. I really, I've asked this guy to stop. I've asked for help. He, he just doesn't get it. So I remember picking up my foot to like kind of kick the back of his chair and I put my foot down. And then it was kind of a conflation of just feeling like wherever I went, I was being stomped on and just dealing with it. And I just couldn't do that anymore. So then I got up and I punched him in the back of the head. And then he looked back and he was days that seemed to have a you know a history of that and he had to smile on his face because he was so dazed and i thought he was laughing at me yet again oh so then i really just let him have it and people the whole class just like freaked out and then like i remember him kind of running to a corner of the room and me going after him and still hitting him. Then he tried to kick me, and I was like, "You don't you dare even try to hit me!" And I like hit him even harder, so he stopped <laughs> retaliating. Mm-hmm. And then I remember at the same time, the entire classroom of boys were trying to hold me back, and they really couldn't. And then somebody says, "You know, hey, get out of the room," to the kid, and he left the room. And then everybody thinks, "Okay, the quote unquote threat has left the room. Maybe Orion will chill out." So everybody chills out, and I go to the door. And it had this huge piece of glass on it and chicken wire to make it harder to break. Mm. And I hit it once and it basically almost shatters. And I was really upset that it didn't break. And then I hit it again and it completely shatters. And the door that's supposed to open inwards somehow opened outwards. And then I went (laughs) through the door and the kid was at the stairwell and he sees me coming. He's like, oh shit. And he like runs down the stairs and there's another door that had the chicken wire and glass that time it only took one punch. And once again, the door opened the way it should not have opened. And then I started chasing him down the stairs and then I realized that my hand was bleeding and I stopped. I was expelled, lost my scholarship and had to go through a fair amount of trouble to get it back and go to a completely different school and try things differently. Have you been in a position after that in which you felt the beast start to come up and you made a different choice? Yeah, definitely. How'd you do that? I realized as I was getting older that this could lead to jail time or worse. And I decided... It wasn't quite worth it unless my life was absolutely in danger. And all the other stuff, I just needed to be stronger, better, harder my emotions, 
it's not that big of a deal. Did you start to talk to yourself when things like that happen and say, hey, Orion, not a big deal. Calm down. Like, what, was there a voice? Did you take deep breaths? Did you have some sort of cognitive exercise that you learned? Hmm. I started really thinking about long-term consequences. Mm. I think anyone that knows me knows I tend to kind of hit my head pretty firmly in the future. What will my actions now lead to later? Particularly when it comes to anger, violence, but certainly with other things too. I mean, I think people that know me know that I'm kind of obsessive about if we do this, then, you know, four steps later. <laughs> <laughs> Tiana's nodding over there. Yes. Everybody's like, what the now? Like, ah, four steps later. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so people think it's tied into just like a general sort of thing, but it, I, it really started with, with me thinking about not flipping out. Mm. And then I just started applying it to more things because generally if I need to learn a skill, I try to apply it to as many things as possible. Because then you're constantly working on the skill. Mm. That's supposed to only in a specific context, which for me makes it much harder to work on a skill. I've always felt really safe in your presence and walking with you. Tiana, do you feel that same way? Oh, absolutely. He's like a bodyguard. And I know you, I mean, you're super, super sculpted and very built. But I think there's also a sense that I feel comfortable walking with men when I know that they are capable of violence, but would probably never turn it on me. I would never turn it on you. But feeling that the beast is there has me feel safe. Do you know what I mean? Even though it's very, very, very deep, yeah. I, I feel so much safer. And the thing is, I definitely have a beast that is far closer to the surface and there are far less consequences for me being angry than for mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. And yes. I'm really aware of that. And I do feel that if I needed to, to defend my life, possibly someone else's that I love, I could, I could kill somebody. Mm. Oh yeah, for sure. It's not even... There's a point where I feel like if somebody's literally threatening the life of myself or my loved ones, I mean, I have a daughter, hell, even my ex, I would, she'll always be my protectorate. If that's the only option, it's it's going down. Last resorts, the big red button, as I like to jokingly call it. <laughs> Definitely last resorts. Yeah. Because yeah. The, the punishment would be so much harsher for you. That's true. It's interesting because... When you first told me about the beast, it wasn't necessarily in this context of these extreme situations. Mm. What was it? I in think the context it, of it was brought up when actually we were talking about like our respectability politics, mm. and we were in a situation. Oh, well, I think it maybe happened before Tuxedo, where we talked about the beast. But I think Tuxedo was when. Where we had like a like real conversations, like I, not that our I, I hate saying that because it feels like our conversations before that weren't real. I don't know about that I, specific topic. Yeah, about that specific topic, and like the beast was also involved. Like we were talking about what happened in Tuxedo. Yeah. We were going to the Ren Fair, actually the Renaissance Fair, and I'm really into cosplay and dressing up and really don't need an excuse but when they're <laughs> <laughs> no you don't that's why you have single-handedly inspired me to the fullest oh. radical self-expression of my life oh, yay. oh yes <laughs> when there is a reason i the extra. really want to <laughs> fully express in every single way it's true. <laughs> and bring as many people along with me as possible <laughs> it's true <laughs> So I I had never been to the Renaissance Fair and it had been part of like my childhood desire actually and <laughs> I did a Ren Fair in high school and I loved it. Oh, mm -hmm. yay. <laughs> yes. They've just always looked like so much fun even before I got into like cosplay and crazy self-expression. I had shared this with James when we had first I think actually I had 
bookmarked just, it on you Facebook. You just liked it on, you yeah, said, just, said, Tiana's interested in going to Ren Fair and is like in Tuxedo, New York. I'm like, I have a client that totally has a gigantic mansion in Tuxedo, New York. Oh. I was like, he's going to let us stay there. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I, I, I don't even th- think I talked to, to Tiana first. I just talked to my client and said, this is what I want to do. I want to come on this weekend or whatever, whatever. Then he's like, yeah, yeah, no problem. So then I talked to Tiana. I was like, look, it's all set up. We're going. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Been there. Good boyfriend. <laughs> we hadn't even talked about it. I just thought that she was interested, and I was like, "Oh, it's happening." By the way, <laughs> this thing can happen. <laughs> it is happening. So that was really exciting, and I had never really been around his clients before an extended amount of time, more than just like, "Hi." On the gym floor. Bye. So I was nervous and excited to be in in that space. And didn't really know how to act or behave, but it was just like, be on your best behavior. (laughs) Because it's also like James's client. Oh, and also at the time, I wanted to do Included. Mm. And so we wanted to talk to them about that as well. What do you mean? What's that? Included was supposed to be, uh, it is still a passion project, but I just realized I need more funding for it, actually, to make it successful. And it's a just a job searching hub for LGBTQ specifically. Yeah. So a uh, Craigslist job site, but you knew the people on the list were LGBTQ because as a small business owner, I want to hire from this community, but I can't legally put out a posting saying I want to hire trans people or queer people. Yes. Because that's discrimination against non-trans and non-queer people. But how can I reach this, quote unquote, yes, but how can I reach this demographic and specifically? And so I wanted to create a a hub where all the jobs could be posted and people can find different positions based on what they were looking for. And the companies would be vetted. So also you would know when you go for an interview that they're not going to discriminate, that they'll have unisex or um, non-gendered bathrooms Mm -hmm. and, you know, respect pronouns and, you know, all the things that you need to have a comfortable, safe work environment as an LGBTQ person. That's beautiful. So that's still my dream. (laughs) And so I wanted to also get his thoughts on the idea. He had worked in, I think, corporate law. And yeah, lawyer so, and a, an accountant. Yeah, lawyer and an accountant. And vast resources. Yes. Not just because of him, but because of his wife. She has a really high position where she has meetings with like ex-heads of state and people like that. <laughs> so I was I was excited to kind of pitch this idea to them and, and get their feedback for many reasons. So going to to prepare for this, we knew that there was going to be a white party where you had to like dress in like all white head to toe. And it was like all the neighbors are going to tie their boats together on the lake. And like huh. we just kind of like drink on the lake. That's essentially. pretty cool. It was, it was actually really cool. Yeah. And and then we knew we had like a few like other gatherings and then the Ren Fair. And that was kind of like our itinerary for the weekend. And when we went to the first event, <laughs> kind of right at the gate literally at the gate <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> literally right at the gate yeah. um i was wearing a headscarf that i had gotten at afropunk the summer before and it had just like the, like beautiful onks and like irises on it so like kind of egyptiany looking and i really just loved the colors more than anything else it wasn't getting the pattern because it belonged to a certain tribe or culture and and so i was wearing my headscarf and just like i think it was like a black like maxi dress or something like jumpsuit something easy breezy the people were just automatically assumed that I was from Africa. Like everyone was like shocked that I didn't even like have an accent. Like they were like <sighs> kind of, it was really strange to, I'd never been put in that kind of situation where my blackness was really thrown into my face. And I'd been in a lot of situations where I'm the only or small minority, like literally minority in the group. So it was kind of interesting for me to like respond in a respectful way, but also I'm angry and frustrated at the same time, but I don't want to show that anger or frustration. And because of these little microaggressions throughout the day, 
by the end of it, I was really emotionally and physically done and walk away from the party and the group of people and be like, did, did you hear that? Did, did this happen? Like, was this all in my head? You know, am I just like seeing things that aren't really there? Like, it, you know, when, when certain, like so many microaggressions happen against you, it almost feels as if like you're the crazy person and it helps to have someone be like, no, they did say that. Saw like, that. I saw that. I felt that. Because not everything is verbal, you know? Some of these things are nonverbal of how they're treating you and interacting with you. Um, some of it's conscious. Some of it's unconscious, yeah. you know? So just trying to process all of that and still maintain, you know, being like... I'm in a professional setting, like these are his clients. I'm, you know, also technically on vacation, you know, and and they drink a lot and I'm not a big drinker. Mm -hmm. So that kind of separate, isolated me a bit too from them. I felt like, like they were trying to include me, but also exclude me at the same time. And I think it kind of culminated then when we were at the all white boat party gathering that one of the guests who's a very lovely woman like everyone there is very lovely people like I, I genuinely enjoyed them as people it was just certain things they did and said that were just like oh we need to educate you or like mm -hmm. oh you're clearly not used to being around black people yeah. or people of color they weren't woke um, no, no <laughs> not at all even though they like were educated and cultured and mm -hmm. well traveled and well spoken and all the things of fancy people should be mm -hmm. they're still just like that oh it's like a, you're rubbing a cat the wrong way like, <laughs> like yes you're petting me but it's so in the wrong direction <laughs> And, and not comfortable oh. and uh, oh. I don't really know how to tell you to pet me in the other direction without like going like deep into you know all of these different things that we is, this is not the time or space for so I just go away I just you know separate myself so when we had the boat party the lovely woman just kind of like looked at James and I and said is, is this the whitest party you've ever been to mm. And we were just looking at each other like, did she just fucking say that? <laughs> did she just really, like, wait, does she want me to really answer that right now? <laughs> Is that a rhetorical question? Because I don't know how to act. This is one of those moments where I imagine you with your laugh. That's like, oh, Oscar. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Oscar. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. It's like, do I laugh or do I cry? Uh -huh. Let me do a little both. <laughs> it's like, just, I'm uncomfortable. You're making me very uncomfortable. I, I did laugh because I knew she said it because she was uncomfortable about the reality of a situation that us being there actually paints a, a very stark reality about the homogeneity of her situation. Yes. I felt that too, but how she expressed her discomfort mm. just alienated me or I felt alienated us even more. Right. It, she, she made, she pointed it out even more like the obvious. Right. But in a, in a terrible way. In a right? terrible in, in way. Just, in just a really off color joke. Yes. yes. Literally. Ha ha ha. Yes. Ha ha ha. Off color. I wonder, I wonder, <laughs> right. I wonder yeah, if there's right. any way that she could have, I mean, obviously she could not have because she didn't do it differently, mm. but a person in that situation could have acknowledged the fact of it and the fact that, that it threw into stark realization mm. the reality that she's living in and the bubble mm. that she's living in, how she might have expressed that and attuned it to your comfort, you know, have said, I'm feeling this way. I feel, oh, my God, I realize that everybody here is white. Mm -hmm. How are you feeling? Like, is there anything I can do in this situation? <laughs> like, is there mm -hmm. any way that a person could address the reality with some vulnerability and some honesty that would make the situation easier to bear and not harder to bear. So how about having an attitude of gratitude, mm. you know? So instead of her 
using this sarcastic approach, which in the end was alienating. She could have used an approach where, you know, I'm really glad to have you here. As you, as you can see, it's very, you know, homogenous here. And, you know, we obviously all enjoy each other. And it's really nice to have an opportunity to be exposed to more and different kinds of people because, you know, we want to, we actually do are open to sharing this with as many people as possible, which is, which was true. They were very inviting and what have you. Yeah, as a guest, it felt like, yes, you're welcome as a visitor in our country club, mm -hmm. but you're not a member. Right. And if there's a way to more genuinely be more open in that way, it is challenging. It it's, is. it's challenging because how do you check on someone's comfort level in that way? The how are you feeling sounds there, really good. If there's anything earlier. that you can do. When Tiana and I went to Boulder, I was like, so how scary. are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you yeah. are you okay? Mm -hmm. Because I'm seeing some things mm -hmm. and I'm not liking what I'm seeing here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we did talk about that. We had a few conversations about Boulder's kind of lack of diversity, um, not just ethnicity. Uh, ethnically? <laughs> ethnically, yes. Mm -hmm. But even, you know, sexual orientation, you know, we found one queer person. We were like, hi, <laughs> yes. Hello, oh queer my person gosh. wearing a bow tie. Hello, we're yes, so glad hello. to meet you. We're so happy hi. to meet you. By the way, she follows me on Instagram. Oh, yay. Oh, cool. She's really lovely. Shout out. You're awesome. amazing. <laughs> Giggle juice for life. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it was kind of awkward to have that conversation with you, but it felt good because I felt like you're seeing what I'm seeing, which made me feel more comfortable. So it helped take out the air, you know, the, like the pressure of like the obvious, like, no, there's not a lot. How it was handled wrongly, and you and I talked about this in Boulder, was then when we went to a mixer of friends that yeah. we had, and I'm the only black person, and they then proceed to ask me, how many black people have I seen since I've been here? Oh, I remember that. And that question was a joke. It was like rubbing it in, though. But it is so rubbing it in. And then they proceed to answer the question for me. Mm. They then say, oh, I saw one. Oh, I saw two. Like, oh, I think there's five. And, and so then whatever the number was, like, I think at that point it was like seven. I was like, yeah, I've seen 11. Yeah. I just shut and they were like, oh, you have? Like, yeah, yeah, we find each other. Because for me, it, it wasn't funny. And no. for me to continue to feed into the joke would just be anger me. And I was getting upset. So for me to kind of stop this conversation from happening, I just need to squash in the button, lie. And said, I saw 11 black people, even though I have not been counting the black people because I don't count She's black like, people. I don't, count black, I don't people. count the black people. That's not a thing. <laughs> like, just like you wouldn't go to another country, like, let me count all the Americans in, right. you know, right. like in Brazil right now. Like, that's just not a thing you do. No, it, and so it was offensive and annoying. They were trying to, again, point out like the, the homogeny of their community and their bubble. Yes. And they're trying to bring me in. But again, by doing that, they're pushing me out and showing me like spotlight. You are black. You are, you, we don't have many of you. You're <laughs> like, different. you're different. Exactly. And it's like, that's not how you make it more inclusive. You make it more inclusive by not treating me differently or right. let's have these conversations. But that's what I said to you. Like, let's have a real conversation about it. Yeah. You know, like if you want to bring up the lack of diversity, let's bring it up. Up. Yeah. Like, let's go into it. I'm not afraid of having these conversations. But what I don't want to do is have a joke that's trying to have a conversation, but glaze over the actual conversation. Which is what happened at this party on the boat. Yes, exactly. Yes, that's exactly what happened. And then what happened after that, that you started... So that that opened up a respectability politics conversation between the two of you. Yes, because I was not feeling like James was 
seeing and responding the same things that I was. Mm. So I was even feeling alienated and isolated from him. I was compartmentalizing. He was hardcore. And I was like, babe, let me in that compartment. Like, I'm knocking on the door. Mm. I'm banging. Like, I need to get into that compartment because I'm feeling so lost and, like, like alone. I really, like, we were always surrounded by people, but I was alone. And I didn't even have the energy to have small talk anymore. Like, I just stood there and, you know, was listening to other people talk because I just couldn't even be bothered. And I was trapped on boats. It's not like I could walk oh away, my God. like, at the party, you know? Like, I could, like, go off and, like, do my own thing. Maybe, like, hit, take a quick hit from, like, my vape pen or something. Like, it was kind of just, like, I'm stuck with you all. And I can't go anywhere <laughs> for hours. So I drank a lot. I drank. Oh my God. We all drank. It was it was we, their thing, so I just joined in. We, we skinny dipped. That happens. We did skinny dip. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> that's what happens when you've been drinking for five, six hours. <laughs> and you're on a boat. And you're on a boat. Uh, everybody skinny dipped. Everyone skinny dipped, yeah. yeah. Which was kind of crazy because I didn't realize how the boats wander. So, like, <laughs> so I swam away from the boats, like, what I thought was just, like, a few strokes away. But then by the time I was treading, treading. yeah, I'm just, like, treading out there, like, looking up at the stars. And then I'm like, okay, I'm getting kind of tired. Let me go back to the boat. The boat was so far <laughs> away. I was, like, I actually panicked that I was going to, like, drown. Like, I wasn't going oh, to make no. it. And so I'm, like, trying to swim back, trying to doggy paddle. And it's kind of like there's music, there's people. So I wasn't sure if I could, like, scream, but they hear me. <laughs> so it was, like. And it was dark. And it was pitch black. I was, and we're black. It was, it was looking at her hard to see her. I was like, holy yeah, shit. Yeah, you didn't know what side of the boat. There's like eight boats locked together. And these are, you know, not tiny boats. So oh it was gosh. it was kind of terrifying to try to swim back to the boats. But I did. I made it back and I was exhausted. And I was just like, never again. <laughs> or like, I'm going to need like a dinghy or something, like a life, yeah. a life raft yeah. to like wander off on this yeah. lake. Because I was like, I can't die in the middle of a lake. Oh my gosh. The <laughs> At the white party. At the ah! white party. <laughs> oh my god, black oh woman dies at all white party. Oh god. Yeah. But not the way you think. Not the way you So awful. So yeah, but it was it was still fun. We had a, a great time. They were a hoot. It just made me look at James differently and bring up things with him that I wouldn't have. Otherwise, well, because the question was, why aren't you affected the way I'm affected? Yes, right? yes. And, and if you're not, and why? Yes, exactly. And this, it made me realize for the first time, I had never been in a primary relationship with another black person before. This is my first real I had had black boyfriends in high school, but, you know, you, I don't think anyone counts their high school boyfriend as, like, a real relationship compared to, like, when they're in their 20s and 30s. So for me, this was the first time me taking a look at that and examining that and what that meant, what that looked like, why I felt the way I felt, because I wouldn't have if it was Matt. If I was in these situations and it was Matt, I don't think I would have felt the same way because I wouldn't have expected Matt to catch all the things that I had had for Orion because Matt was white and Orion's black. I needed him to see and feel the same things that I was seeing and feeling because we were both black. You told me that you had a story, and this is before I introduced you to, that black men didn't like you very much. Yeah. I felt that way about black women. Yeah. <laughs> you felt that way about black women. <laughs> yeah, it's yes. kind of, I've heard that. Yes, yes, no, it's true. Yeah, growing up, like they, all the guys in my neighborhood and my school, even like before I went to private all white school, um, and I was going to like charter schools and like pu public schools, and they're mostly black kids. 
the black guys never liked me. They never wanted to go out. They, they never even flirted with me. They made fun of me. They teased me. And like, and part of me was like, oh, that means they like me, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like that. Sometimes. <laughs> like sometimes. But no, they actually were just assholes teasing me. There was no like hidden like, oh, I'm going to pull your pigtail and run away and secretly <laughs> want you to chase me so I can kiss you. Like, it was like, no, I want to pull your pigtail because I want to pull your fucking pigtails. Like, <sighs> it was really just to be mean and cruel. And so because of that, I didn't really pursue black guys, really. And then when I started, like, dating, my first boyfriend was a black guy. But I was wearing, like, when we met, like, crazy straight hair and like like I I don't know I kind of felt like I had to like Europeanize myself to even like have him find me attractive mm. and then after that it was basically all white guys and Asian guys and Jewish guys and and then James is, then became like the next black guy in my life. Did you feel exoticized by them by those white Asian partners that you had? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I wouldn't say as far as like they fetishized me or if they did, they did it in a way that was still respectful and didn't make me feel gross, objectified in any way. And again, those weren't really serious relationships. So it's hard to say. The trip to Tuxedo and the experiences there really changed and affected our relationship and made us have really big conversations that we hadn't had yet. What were the revelations about each other from those conversations? I think for me, that was the my first time hearing about the beast and how he compartmentalizes himself. <laughs> compartmentalizes. Yes, compartmentalizes. Carpart. 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 Compartmentalizes. Compartmentalizes. He's carpart. Carpart. That's like actually a really good way to think about it. Yeah. If you're trying to teach a, a child. <laughs> And so understanding about his personality in that way was a revelation. To keep myself from flipping out. Yeah, to keep yourself from flipping out. But it became, like, too sterile to me. It's like you're too emotionless. Like, you're too calm. And not that, like, you have to flip out, but it was like even when we were by ourselves and I would be like, Yo, that shit was That's crazy, bullshit, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> like, and you believe they said, like, what? And that, and and you'd be like, oh, yeah, well, you know. And I'd be like, um, wait. Not tap, tap, tap. What? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, let's go. No, let's rewind. No, that was crazy, <laughs> right? <laughs> let's go back. Yeah. I don't understand. Yeah, I was still in the house. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, I still was like. <laughs> it, exactly. So it never felt like we had downtime. Right. Like, and we never had time for just he and I outside of us being at the Ren Fair, which isn't really downtime, no, you know, because no. we're interacting. We're still around people. I didn't even really ha feel comfortable having sex in the house. Like, yeah. I mean, their grandmother was right down the hallway from us. Oh, great. But, so that kind of <laughs> was like a little bit of a boner killer for me. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, I fucked with my mom in the next room. So I don't know. I, I can't really say that oh, having my a God. family member in the house is really a big deal. I joked with my cousin that I can't even have sex when my parents are in the same state. Yep. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Wow. It's, it's obviously a little bit of an exaggeration, yeah. but. Yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was part of my, one of my first sexual exploits was like hooking up with my quote unquote boyfriend at the time. And like, we were supposed to be watching a movie. And I was like, what if I just sat on your lap? And. They won't be able to tell. <laughs> we totally just fucked in the dining room where my mom was in the living room. Oh, my God. <laughs> so you got away with it. And yes. then you're like, oh, this is delicious. Yes. No, 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 no. Yes. Oh, Lila, <laughs> bringing up all the things. It's all making sense now. <laughs> oh, my God. So funny. I was wondering about the compartmentalization and if it scared you, Tiana. No, it didn't scare me because once I had addressed it and told him that I needed him to express 
that side of him. Like, I can respect him not doing it in the moment. Yes. And needing to suppress in order to, you know, survive, survive. essentially, because these are his clients. It's his livelihood. So I get nodding, not needing to be like, bitch, you crazy, mm-hmm. you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. or like, no, this is the craziest, like, this isn't the whitest party we've ever been to. Like, you know, you can't really, like, blurt out all the things that you want to just say to people. But then I was like, when we by ourselves, I need you to do the blurting. I need to see and feel that, you know, I'm not alone. And even if I, we can totally have different experiences. I didn't want him to feel as if like, well, if you didn't get the same thing that I felt, you know, then you're wrong and I'm right. It was just more of like, I felt like he didn't. um, Trust your feelings. Yeah. But you wanted him to bear witness Yes, definitely bear witness. And I, I felt like because these were, again, microaggressions that a lot of people overlook that yeah. he shouldn't have. And I felt like he, I needed his help catching them because they were almost happening so fast that you can't process it all. Mm-hmm. It's like a bunch of pinpricks. And so, you know, pinpricks, you can't see you're being pricked. You just, like, once there have been a thousand of them, you're like, where's all this blood coming from? Like, right. what? When did I start bleeding? Mm. <laughs> like, why is my gut hurt? <laughs> mm. And so, you know, it's like you don't realize to the thousandth one that, you know, it's actually affecting you. And I needed him to be like, did you catch pinprick 50 and then 78 and then, <laughs> you know, 102? Yeah. <laughs> like, that 102 was a big one, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, you know, because I wasn't getting that from him, like, I had to tell him I needed that. I needed it because we're both black. That was the other part of it that I didn't realize until, like, I said it out loud. Does it allow you to relax in a way that you were unable with other partners? No, because I'm going to be me regardless. My partner, Tragic, actually said in the best way, it's like, I fit in everywhere and yet I fit in nowhere. And that kind of is true, uh, where I do feel comfortable everywhere and yet I always feel like a sore thumb Everywhere I go. Part is like I I tend to purposely stand out, you know. I intentionally try to dress different and, you know, be this kind of way because I don't want to be like a sheeple. I don't want to be like everyone else. So I intentionally try to make myself stand out. But, you know, when it's kind of like you feel like emotionally you stand out, you know, like that kind of like outcast feeling is different than being just like the person who's wearing cat ears at the party (laughs) you know it's it's a a different so all the places yeah you feel this in all the places pretty much yeah yeah when it's large groups when we're in a one-on-one like close friends like you know at my birthday where I think that was the the only time where it was that many people and I felt completely comfortable and at home and but I had curated that environment oh, I yes. had literally yeah, created amazing. that space and environment for myself and it was just really beautiful getting feedback that everyone else loved that container that I had created too and that they felt comfortable and they felt the energy and the vibrations mm. yeah definitely I guess the last thing to say about the uh, conversation was you know I was really really deeply moved, pleased, and I felt deeply connected to Tiana because she felt safe enough to share what she was going through and what she needed from me. And it's something I could totally offer. I just needed to know that she needed it. Mm. Yeah, I feel like even in recent history, you know, we've been chatting with uh, our mutual friend and now a client of mine, and he tends to say some off-the-cuff things, and I just immediately am like, <laughs> I'm just on it. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, are. Yeah, I'm just like, oh, okay. What do you mean? He's he's white, and he just says certain comments. Like I guess one of the things he was saying was like, "Oh, you know, it seems like uh, these these young black girls seem so attracted to me as an older white man." And he just would keep saying stuff like that. And you know, Tiana and I had spoke about it. How she didn't feel entirely comfortable with it, and I didn't feel comfortable with it either. But I was just like, "All right, he's just being awkward in himself or whatever." When she brought it up, that it was actually giving her, I wouldn't say high level of distress, but certainly. Uh, enough to remark on. I just realized, and she also said she didn't want to go through the trouble of educating him. And I was like, huh, I can educate him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah and how did you do that? that? I started off by saying that 
you know, he's he's getting into the whole scene, the whole the lifestyle scene. The poly uh, scene poly and kink, the kink scene. Yeah, yeah. And we tend to go to events where we're specifically building up a whole POC community within the lifestyle, a uh, person of color uh, community within the lifestyle. Which is so awesome. And I just want to encourage you because I think you two are the ones. You're the Yay. ones in New York City to be the leaders of this community. Yay. Thank you. So, <laughs> you know, he's really enamored with both of us actually certainly mm-hmm. initially tiana but but i mean how he became my client i told him i was like look you know if you're gonna keep hanging out with us you're gonna be in a situation with a lot of pocs and you need to know that this kind of language and this way of thinking is not really going to make you friends and phones people I, I get that you have this idea in your head but just just stick to the idea that you are a nice guy and you are friendly and you're creative and you have all these other qualities. Just stick with that. All this other stuff, it's in your head and it's not productive. Just know that. Like anything along that, those sort of line of thinking about, you know, black, white, just just don't. <laughs> just don't. Mm. And he's like, oh, you know, I hear that. And he said that he was using that language based on a conversation he had had with another um, young black woman or whatever. And I said, that's fine, but you, you, you just leave it to that situation. It's for people of color to bring up certain things to, and you deal with it on a one-on-one basis. You don't just make an assumption mm. going forward. Because yeah, that, and apply uh, it to other. Like he yeah. used the joke. It was a, a situation that he had with her, mm-hmm. and he was trying to share it with us, which is amazing and wonderful. That was fine. Yeah, and that was fine. It was when he kept reiterating it and applying to it to other situations mm-hmm. that then it became a bit problematic. And it was like, no, that's it's not a pattern, you know, in that way. And James has way more patience than I do. <laughs> James is so good at that. I'm I just, I just shifted, I'm so learning from I him the way in that I can, way. So I just shifted the way I can it. <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay, you're someone that needs education, and you're going to be around. So sure, we can have these conversations. I think it's also I don't enjoy texting very much i know and- <laughs> <laughs> it's, one of our, it's one of our biggest challenges yeah, it's like with everyone, <laughs> biggest, biggest challenges. everyone. well that's well, so me sorry everyone out there <laughs> for me it's, here, for me it's conflated because i seem to have horrific timing of trying to have a phone conversation with you yeah you actually do so then i'm like weird so thing. then i'm like just things that i want to communicate and then it ends up leading to situations where you're like why did you tell me that i'm like well every time i try to call you you're like not able to talk and mm-hmm. you don't want to text <laughs> it puts you in a bad situation and the days pass and I'm like yeah all this stuff happened I hooked up with this person and you're like what do you mean you already told me this now I'm like I would have told you on time <laughs> but you know I call and you're like there's like 10 other people talking to you and they don't seem to give a fuck that you're on the phone with me so I'm like I can't have a conversation <laughs> So, you know, I'm like stuck. <laughs> and so we're like one on one alone. Thank God we have lots of time like that to do. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. She is definitely an in person person. Yeah, and that, that's fine. And that, that's what it's going to be, you know. I just, do. I, just do know that I, I really show up in I, person. Yeah, you do. Like. You do. You do. Absolutely. And I will update you on all the things. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fair. I can't argue because this literally just happened. So <laughs> I'm trying to like come up with a rebuttal. Be like, but then there was no. There's there's literally like no. You're right. Okay, moving on. <laughs> 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 this like literally just happened. <laughs> what yeah. are other things that you struggle with in your relationship? Mm. <sighs> This podcast was edited by Mr. Chad Michael Snavely. You can find his full roster on chadmichael.com. My intro music was created by Alan Markley. He's Plastic Cannons on Instagram. And my sensual cover art was illustrated by Shauna Shea, whom you can find on 99designs. In next week's episode of Horizontal, available exclusively to patrons, become one, on patreon.com slash horizontal with Lila, we have the third installment of my conversation with Tiana and Orion, in which we get to witness some of the deep inner workings of their relationship. It's remarkable. It's really something. May 21st is the two-year anniversary of Horizontal, 
And if you'd like an invite to the celebratory pajama party, at which I will attempt a recording entirely unprecedented in the horizontal verse, become a patron in the next 10 days. Until next time, may you have someone to love, something to do, and something to look forward to. Thank you for getting horizontal with us in the Bronx. Yes. yes, it's going so well. You're doing great. Right? How well. do you feel? It's really good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there were several so moments where I was like, she's relaxed. She's cool. Oh, well, that's good. It seems that way. You're like, no. Yeah. I don't think James can feel me like gripping onto him. Like, uh.